Hello friends, welcome to my shelf. As I mentioned in my recent reading wrap up, I have not had a five star read in two whole months. I've read a handful of five star books this year, all of them back in January, and only one of them was an adult novel. And that book is of course, Clara and the Sun. I am still thinking about this book. I'm still obsessed with it. I wanna reread it. But in the meantime, I need another book. I need another book that I can fall in love with. So not only has it been over two months since I had a five star read, I have read 49 books so far this year, which means my next read is my 50th book of the year. And I just really want it to be a good book. I really want it to be a five star. Is that too much to ask? Is it too much to ask? Probably, but I'm gonna ask anyway. So what we're gonna do is take a look at the books on my shelves and see if I can come up with a handful of five star predictions. And then we're gonna pick one, we're gonna read it, and by the end, hopefully, I'm gonna have a new favorite book. So what have we got? Which of you is going to be a favorite? Oh, you know what? This one might be a little bit of a wild card, but I kind of feel like Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death is gonna be my jam. It doesn't have great reviews on Goodreads. It's very mixed. People either love it or hate it. And I just, I feel like I'm gonna be the one who loves it. So this might be a bit of a risky pick, but let's put it in our pile of options. Oh, a book that I really, really wanna read and I just, I feel like I'm gonna love it, but I have no evidence to support that claim whatsoever, is The Gin Waits 100 Years. This is a brand new book. And honestly, this link is so tenuous, but I feel like it's probably just because my favorite book of last year was The Gollum and the Ginny, that I think now in my head, I'm just associating anything Gollum and anything Ginny with a potential new favorite. But I mean, look at this cover. Doesn't it look promising? Let's add it to the pile as an option. Ooh, a book that has been on my shelf for ages that I'm convinced I'm gonna love is The Lonely Castle in the Mirror. I have heard some people say that it's kind of boring, but I don't know, man, I love a boring book sometimes. <laughs> and it seems like it's gonna be a good balance of emotional and whimsical and slow paced. Like these are things that when they work for me, they work for me. They're like kryptonite going on the pile. I feel like Song of the Crocodile could probably be a five star for me. This is historical fiction set in Australia. It's been one of those books I've been meaning to get to for quite a while, so maybe we should add it to our list. Another book I feel like I'm gonna love is My First and Only Love. This, maybe it's just the cover talking, but I, I'm already in love. And the author has been billed as the Virginia Woolf of Palestinian literature. High praise. Oh, a book that I feel like is probably a pretty smart choice actually is Siren Queen by Nevo. Now I have read two or three books by Nevo, all in the Singing Hills cycle. And I think this is historical fantasy, which is very up my alley. Another book I'm really excited about is Terror Story by Hilary Lecter. If you remember a couple of years ago, Temporary by this author was one of my favorites of the year. I still think about that book to this day. It's very short though, so I'm not sure how satisfying it would be for you to watch me read in a video, but I feel like it belongs on this pile. Oh, another weird little book that I have never heard anybody talk about on booktube, but I'm convinced is gonna be a favorite, is Where the Wild Ladies Are. The reason I picked up this book last year, I think, was just, I was like on Facebook, which like, <laughs> I'm never on Facebook anymore, but I was on Facebook and there was a post that came up in some group that I was in. I think it's about Jap Japanese translated literature. And somebody was asking for a book recommendation after having read and loved There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job, which is one of my favorite books. And somebody responded saying this, this is the book you need to read. It's even translated by the same person. So I feel like this definitely belongs on our pile of options. I feel like one of these could be my next five star read. What do I feel like reading right now? Cause I'm a mood reader. So like that, that is kind of important to this question. You know what? I would say the two books that are jumping out to me right now uh, Lonely Castle in the Mirror and Siren Queen. So maybe I should put them up on a poll and let you decide. But I feel like only two options isn't fun. Is there another one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? We'll add Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death to the options for you. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put up a poll on my community page and let you pick which of these three books I'm going to read. Which of these is gonna be my next five star read? So I will be back in a couple of hours and let you know which of these three books you have chosen to be my next favorite book. No pressure or anything. Okay, so it has been four hours since I posted the poll. Let's check in and see what my new favorite book is gonna be. Wait, seriously? <laughs> 
We've got a tie. You're supposed to be helping me pick, not make me pick. Okay, so after four hours, Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death has fallen behind, but Siren Queen and Lonely Castle in the Mirror are tied. Oh, I don't want to decide. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read the first chapter of each of these books and then I'll check in with you and then we can decide. Yeah, I feel like that's a good idea. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, so I have finished the first chapter of these two books, although they were two very, very different lengths, so they don't really feel comparable in any way. Uh, the first chapter in Simon Cream was just nine pages. I did really like how it started out. The very first sentence read, Wolf Studios released a tarot deck's worth of stories about me over the years. And so then the first chapter, which is like nine, actually it's not even nine pages, it's more like five, goes on to tell this story, but like the correct version of it, where it seems like in childhood our main character was offered by a stranger to become a movie star and she's with her younger sister and she kind of brushes this off uh, and then a bit later they're walking home and they come across a ticket booth and it's a nickel to get in to see a film of Romeo and Juliet and then essentially it's just a bit of a description of the movie. So I suppose what it did was just set up a little bit of background for the characters and also set up uh, clearly like one of the main central themes is going to be around the movie industry films and Hollywood and all of that good stuff so I wouldn't say that I was not liking it or anything but it was only a handful of pages and like I said it felt more like a prelude than like an introduction to the story proper in a lot of ways so I don't have a lot of opinions on that very first experience on the complete other end of the spectrum the first chapter in The Lonely Castle in the Mirror was like 40 pages long so I mean I've already read like 10% of this book. So I kind of low key already feel committed, I'm not gonna lie. And I can see already why a lot of people would say that this book feels kind of boring. It's very slow, but I was enjoying it. I was enjoying that first chapter. Basically we're introduced to a young girl named Kokoro. She is like just entering or has just entered junior high. And in the first few months of junior high, she had a really awful experience and was bullied. So she's now refusing to attend school. And this seems like it's been going on for quite a while. Her parents are kind of trying to set her up with like a new special school for kids who are struggling at school or who are refusing to attend. But even that she is struggling to get to. But then one day when she's just like hanging out in her room, you know, when she should be at school at like three o'clock in the afternoon or something, her mirror starts glowing. And obviously curious about this, she kind of goes up to it, she touches it and she gets sucked in to this weird place, this castle, where a girl wearing a wolf mask meets her. This girl calls herself the Wolf Queen. There are seven kids in total in this castle. And basically the Wolf Queen tells them that for the next year, they can essentially come every day to the castle in the mirror between the hours of nine and five and try and seek out a hidden key. And whoever finds the key will get a wish. But if they break any of the rules, like visiting the castle outside of the designated hours between nine and five, then they will be eaten by wolves. What? Also, it seems like the six other kids, although all very different from different backgrounds, all have one thing in common. And it seems like that might be that all of them aren't going to school. And I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued to see where it goes. I don't know if it's gonna be a bit of a found family or a commentary on bullying or what, I'm not sure. Or maybe it's gonna center more around like that time period. Like they're only allowed to stay there between nine and five. Like are the kids going to enjoy this escape from their real lives so much that they don't wanna leave? I don't know, I just, I'm already intrigued. I've already got questions. I'm already feeling curious. And I just really like the tone and I'm enjoying the gentle slowness of it, at least for now. So why don't we just have one more look at the poll and see if the results have changed. Oh, there we go. Okay, so it's been six hours since I posted the poll and Lonely Castle in the Mirror has edged out quite a way in front. It's got 48% of the vote, whereas Siren Queen is now sitting on 30%. So quite a big difference. Well, I suppose that kind of settles it. We're gonna be reading this book together this week. Come on. <laughs> do you like me sitting here so I can be your ladder? What do you think? Do you think it's a five star book? You do? <laughs> That's good. So I am up to part two. I've read 122 pages and I do understand what people mean when they say 
nothing really happens in this book. <laughs> like we're learning things. Like there are things that are kind of happening, but it's not action packed. It's not plot forward. So the majority of this first part since the first chapter has been spent in the castle and watching Kokoro get to know these other children. But between the time we're spending in the castle, we're also learning more about Kokoro's experience at home and also the extent of the bullying that she experienced that kind of led her to stop going to school in the first place. I won't go into the details, but like, I mean, it started as bullying often does with just kind of like kids ignoring each other or kind of saying mean things at school but it definitely escalated to a point where you absolutely empathize with Kokoro and why she does not feel safe to go anywhere, let alone school. I think one of the really interesting things though is that we learned that Kokoro has not told her parents, has not told anybody about the bullying and certainly has not spoken about the extent of it. And she now feels like she can't really tell her parents the full truth of it because it was almost so horrible that it doesn't really seem true or real. So essentially she feels very, very isolated in this experience and it's just really, really sad. So this first section has covered a couple of months. So we've spent that time with Kokoro spending most of her spare time, especially during the weekdays at the castle. Of the seven children in the castle, four are boys, three are girls. And at first the other two girls kind of hit it off in a way that makes Kokoro feel again isolated one of the boys though his name is urishino i think and he i mean the way he's characterized especially early on i didn't enjoy essentially he's a fat kid and that is the primary characterization we get for him like literally the first five or six times this character is mentioned it is specifically about his weight or like his eating or something eventually a second characteristic is introduced and that is that he is kind of as Kokoro says, he's in love with the idea of love and he kind of forms these infatuations with each of the girls in turn and he's very forward with his affections in a way that's uncomfortable. We've had two other developments right towards the end of this section. The first is that one day Kokoro's mum kind of came home during her working hours and realised that Kokoro was not home and so she kind of confronts her about this and is like you know I popped home a few times and you're not in the house like where are you going? The second thing and this has just happened like a couple of pages before this and the end of the section is that one of the kids Rion I think has just declared that he is actually attending school so the rest of them aren't and they've all kind of just assumed that they all aren't going to school for some reason and it's something they don't really talk about but it turns out that Rion is actually at like a boarding school in Hawaii. So his time zone is very different. So anyway, that's the first section. Like I said, like stuff is happening. We're learning about these kids. We're watching a dynamic kind of develop and change. We're learning more about Kokoro and why she doesn't go to school and what's been going on for her. But in terms of the castle, like none of the kids are really looking for the key for the wish or anything like that. We haven't really seen much of the wolf girl. Like it's just kind of is there and we're just watching these kids interact. So I'm not really having strong feelings just yet about it. I'm intrigued. I remain intrigued, but I, I'm not like in love with it yet. I feel like it could kind of go either way. But our second section is called Second Semester Things Fall Into Place. So I'm curious to see just how that might be happening and I'm gonna get back to reading. I'll talk to you soon. Yes, it's late, it's bedtime. But just before I head to bed, I needed to check in with you because I have finished section two and actually I read a little past section two. I've read the first chapter of section three. So I'm up to page 222. Section two was pretty short and section three is called third semester goodbye. And I will just say that overall, I feel like I'm feeling similarly to when we last checked in. I'm intrigued, but like I'm not being completely blown away. At this very moment, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is five stars, it's not giving five star feeling, but equally I'm enjoying reading it. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that this could get a five star by the end. It just feels like one of those books that really is a slow build. And I feel like the ending is really, really gonna either make or break this book. Anyway, essentially what happened in our second section is that our kids figured out that they actually all attend the same junior high school. Although that's not quite correct. Essentially they all are supposed to be at the same high school. And so even though for quite a while already now, the kids have had an understanding that most of them aren't attending school, but it's something they don't really talk about. But then out of the blue, kind of months into this experience of meeting each other at the castle in the mirror every day, they figure this out, that they all have a connection to this same high school, the same high school that Kokoro was going to. And so they hatch this plan to basically all go to school 
on the same day and meet each other. Not only meet each other, but basically like support each other in returning to school for the first time. We don't know a lot about exactly why all of the children aren't going to school because it's something they don't like to talk about, but it's quite clear that most, if not all of them, have had some kind of like issue or problem that has kept them away. So they set the date for the 10th of January to all show up to school at the same day and they all kind of like memorize each other's classes and then they agree that if anything goes wrong, they will meet at the nurse's office. And so on the 10th of January we follow Kokoro as she heads to school for the first time in months. She's terrified but she's also feeling emboldened by this show of solidarity by her new friends. When she gets to school she encounters one of the girls who bullied her. Even saying bullied like how bad what happened to Kokoro like bully feels like it doesn't quite <laughs> really cover everything and Kokoro just freaks out. So instead of even going to class at all, she decides to go straight to the nurse's office. She's freaking out and she's asking the nurse pretty much straight away if any of her friends from the castle in the mirror have been here. And she's listing off their names and the nurse is like, what are you talking about? There are no students with those names at this school. And obviously she's freaking out, but I, as the reader, am like, what? What the fuck is going on? My first thought and the one that I'm kind of rooting for is that all of these kids are actually from different points in time. Related to that but a little bit different, I mean maybe if this book is playing with magical realism and some fantasy elements it could be like a parallel worlds kind of situation. That could be fun too. And while I think that could be interesting I do feel like sometimes parallel worlds can be a tricky thing to pull off in a satisfying way by the end but I don't know, I'm curious to see where it goes. However, I feel like there is a third option and I mean, I'm open to that one being the case as well. And that is that potentially this whole castle in the mirror is just something in Kokoro's head where essentially the castle in the mirror and all of these friends are a figment of Kokoro's imagination to help her deal with what's happened to her. At this point, I honestly could not tell you which is more likely. So again, I am just intrigued. Yes, this is slow pace. Yes, not a lot is happening. And yet everything that we learn, I at least am finding really interesting. Now heading into section three, which is again called the third semester goodbye. I don't think I mentioned that essentially when all of the kids first showed up at the castle, the wolf queen who kind of gave them the rules of this castle basically said that they have until the end of March. That's all the time that they have in this castle to find the key that will give them a wish. And the Wolf Queen says that if anybody finds the key and decides to make a wish, they will get their wish, that will come true, but all of them will forget about the castle in the mirror. They will no longer be able to access it and all of the memories that they have made in it so far will be gone. If however they get to the end of March and nobody has found the key or even if somebody's found the key but nobody has made a wish, obviously that means that no wish is granted but they will all return to their own worlds. They'll never be able to return to the lonely castle in the mirror but they will retain their memories. And I feel like these constraints are now, as we head into the ending of the book, going to become much more important and more relevant to the relationships and the dynamics between the children. And even though I feel like we've gotten to know the characters of these children quite well, we don't really know a lot about their lives and the sorts of things that they might be missing or wanting, the sorts of things that they might be willing to sacrifice everything for to make a wish. And I feel like those are the sorts of things that we're going to learn in the last third of this book. And honestly, at this point, although this book is not like a roller coaster ride, I honestly have no idea where we're heading. And I know it's a word that I have used continuously throughout this video, but I remain intrigued. I'm invested. I'm intrigued and I want to go to bed so that I can wake up early and get stuck straight in and I'm hoping we can finish this book tomorrow because I want to find out. I want to find out what the hell is going to happen. Hi. So it has actually been like 36 hours since I checked in with you. I finished this book on Saturday evening. On Sunday obviously we had the weekly rally here in Nam for a free Palestine so I went to that and afterwards I was pretty tired. So I didn't get a chance to check in with you yesterday which does mean that I've had like a good couple of days to just mull on how I feel about this book. Because let me tell you, I knew throughout the whole book reading experience that the, the feeling was kind of like a four star-ish, somewhere around there. But I had the feeling that the ending would either bump it up to a five or drop it right down to a three, maybe even a two. So I was having a good time reading, but honestly, as far as the project of this video, trying to get a five star, it was touch and go. It could have gone either way. And I'm just gonna tell you, 
It was a five star. It was a five star. Now, as I've said multiple times throughout this video already, I absolutely understand why people don't like this, why they think it's boring, why they think nothing happens, because it's kind of true. But as we've also mentioned, I was intrigued from start to finish. I wanted to know what was going on. I wanted to know what was going on with the castle, with the wolf girl. Was it time travel? Was it alternate worlds? Was it all in just Kokoro's head? I wanted to know more about these kids. I wanted to know why they weren't going to school, what was going on for them, but also if they were going to return, what was going to happen to them. I wanted to know if they were ever going to meet, like what this year together, what was that going to mean for them? I wanted to know what wishes they all wanted to make. I wanted to know if anybody was going to make the wish, which would mean that everybody would forget this time together. I just had so many questions like that just bubbling under the surface of the entire book and I think overall I just really enjoyed the tone I enjoyed the atmosphere I enjoyed the fact that it was slow paced it kind of had this whimsical but melancholic tone so I was enjoying the reading experience but as we said it was the ending that was going to make or break this book for me and that is exactly what happened I'm talking literally like the last 15 or 20 pages is what took it from a four to a five star for me the way that every single one of my questions was answered and more the way that every single little thread was tied together together with such precision, with such intention, with such purpose was honestly, it was both mesmerizing and it was also just so emotionally satisfying. And I know I've been telling you about the spoilers, at least vaguely as we've been going along, but I don't even know how to begin to explain the ending because I literally mean every single thread. But I suppose if you've made it all the way to the end in hopes that I will spill the beans, I will do my best at least with some of the, the bigger moments. So I suppose the big one is that I was right in that all of these kids have come to the castle from different points in time. Some as far back as the 80s, some as far forward as in like the 2020s. Basically one of the kids who are in the castle. Her name is Aki and she is one of the kids who has been kind of really pushing for at least one of them to get their wish. She really wants to get her wish and we learn why. We learn some of the horrible stuff that has been happening to her at home and why she so desperately wants to escape it. But right up until the end of March none of them have been able to find the key and so rather than returning through the mirror back into her real world where the, like the castle is just going to disappear. She decides that the day before the castle is going to go, she's just going to stay past five o'clock, which according to the Wolf Queen will mean that the wolves will eat her. She's basically trying to kill herself. That's how important the castle has become to her and how much the idea of not having the castle to retreat to anymore is eating her up inside. As this happens though, Kokoro, our protagonist, has kind of figured out some of the clues that the Wolf Queen has been giving them. That basically the setup and the, the premise for the castle is tied to a fairy tale. It's a fairy tale that I'm not even familiar with. It was called like the Wolf and the Seven Goats or something. And basically the seven kids are like stand-ins for these seven goats. And so through making this connection, Kokoro realizes where the key is. And she realizes that she needs to make the wish to bring Aki back and basically save everybody, which she manages to do. But obviously this will mean that they will all forget. They'll all forget each other and the time that they've spent in the castle the last year, which in and of itself is quite emotional, quite powerful. The fact that Kokoro would give up her own wish and her own desire to save this friend that she's not even gonna remember. But then a whole bunch of things come together in quick succession. <laughs> that honestly just floored me. And essentially there has been this teacher who has helped Kokoro immensely. She kind of runs this special school for kids who are struggling. And she was the first person that Kokoro felt like able to talk to about what had happened to her. She was the person that she first felt safe and able to trust. She was a really important part of Kokoro's healing journey outside of the castle. And she was so impactful in fact that she spoke to some of the other kids about this woman and they sought her out in their own timelines. And she helped all of them as well. Well, it turns out Aki, the girl from the 80s, is actually this woman who after returning from the castle and being saved by Kokoro, she basically gets into service work and helping children and children who are struggling. And she dedicates her whole life, her career to this. And so essentially, although they don't know it, none of them know it, she has been saving each and every one of them this entire time. I'm crying already, but there's more. Then we've got Rion, the boy who has been studying abroad in Hawaii. Just before all of this kind of goes down, we learn about his story and what his wish would have been. Basically, he had an older sister who died when he was about five or six. He was so close to her and adored her more than anything in the world. And so obviously his wish is just to have her back. And we actually get quite a bit of backstory and time with Rion in his past. And we also see that after his sister died, his mother in particular kind of really struggled to connect with him and it seems like she almost resented him for surviving and that's essentially the reason that she sent him off 
abroad to Hawaii so she doesn't have to deal with him, doesn't have to live with him. It's a lot, it's heartbreaking. But essentially he has figured out that the Wolf Queen is his sister. She had a dollhouse in the shape of a castle and she was obsessed with fairy tales. One of her favorites being the Wolf and the Seven Goats. On top of that, she died on March the 30th, which she's already said is going to be the final day that the castle can exist for these kids. So her ending is the castle's ending. And obviously it's time travel, it's timey-wimey. <laughs> and so essentially it's not just that like on her deathbed through some kind of like death magic, she managed to create the castle for Rion, but literally she has spent the last year of her life in this castle with him. And so it's his opportunity to say goodbye to his sister because he was almost too young to really do it the first time. And so after Kokoro has saved Aki and the other kids, the castle is crumbling and everybody else has left. They've all forgotten everything. But Rion turns to the Wolf Queen and kind of like tells her that he knows who she is, but he says that he can't stand the idea of forgetting this last year that they've gotten to share together. And so he asks that he can just remember this. He understands if the other kids can't, but he just wants to be able to hold on to these memories. On top of that, it turns out that Rion and Kokoro were the only two who were actually like from the same year. They just hadn't met each other because he'd been in Hawaii. And so after all of this, and because he remembers it, he decides to confront his mother and says that he wants to come home to Japan and he wants to go to this school. And so the very last page, the very last thing that we get is him walking into school on the very first day of the second year of junior high and walking up and introducing himself to Kokoro. She has decided to try again and return for the second year. And so now she has a friend, she has a friend to support her through. So I don't even know if I explained that very well, but basically all of these kids, although they don't all remember each other, they have all impacted each other so drastically and not just in the time that they spent together in the castle, but they go on to touch each other's lives through the decades without even knowing it. Oh goodness, I'm crying so much. More or less this book felt like an exercise in empathy and it was just so beautifully done. This is a story that confronts directly how damaging bullying can be, but also how other things that happen in children's lives affect them and their capacities and their capacity to go to school and to achieve in the way that we expect young people to. In a lot of ways, this book feels very rooted in the tradition of Japanese fantasy that I've read. It reminded me a lot of books like The Miracles of the Namiya General Store, which I read recently and also really loved. I think we in the West often describe these sort of books as like magical realism. And like, I understand why we do that because they're not like high fantasy other worlds kind of stuff. They're all very grounded in reality. And even when we're literally Literally, like it's a portal fantasy. We're slipping through mirrors into other worlds. There's something about these books that feel so grounded in reality and are so desperately trying to convey something about the human experience. And both of these books, it feels like the author is really trying to capture a sense of like obligation that we have to each other, remind us of our connectedness and how much influence and impact we have on everybody around us, good and bad, whether we know it or not. I really enjoyed The Miracles of the Namiya General Store. It was very creative, but I think like this book did steal my heart in a way that the Namiya General Store didn't quite manage. And I feel like in a lot of ways that is because even though this book feels more high concept fantasy in terms of like, you know, like portal fantasy, at the same time, it felt so much smaller. Like we were spending time with just these seven kids and sometimes we were just spending time watching them play games or watching them chat or watching them drink tea together. It felt so small and intimate and yet grand and beautiful. I just loved it. I loved the tone. I loved the atmosphere. I just loved the feeling of this book. It's one of those things that I'm just gonna carry with me. It was one of those books that I just kind of hugged after finishing. Obviously there are a couple of things that weren't like my absolute favorite about this book. Obviously we spoke about how at the beginning, one of the characters in their introduction and for like the early part of their getting to know each other, his primary characteristic was that he was fat. But even for him, we get so much humanization and connection by the end of the book. And even though the dynamic between the seven of them is sometimes tension filled, is not always easy. At the end of the day, these kids grow to love and understand each other in a way that nobody else could. I think the other thing is that there was probably like half an hour of reading where I was like, okay, this is getting a little bit slow, <laughs> even for my taste. And that was kind of right towards the end before the ending kind of like picked up. So like, absolutely this book is slow, but 
for me it absolutely worked it nailed the landing and this is a book that i'm just going to remember forever which makes me so happy i'm so happy thank you so much for choosing this book for me i feel like we might have to do this again pretty soon because like i have felt a lack of five stars in my life in the last couple of months i feel like i need to catch up a little bit it would be nice to have a few five stars this month or in the next couple of months so i mean obviously i've shown my bookshelves plenty of times you know most of the books that are on my shelf i've done hauls and all of the rest of that so if there have been any books that i have mentioned or that you've seen on my shelf in the last six months or so that you just feel like I need to read and that I'm gonna love please please let me know in the comments below and I absolutely will be paying attention to those comments and maybe we can do another fun vlog like this in the near future so thank you so much for giving me another book to love I'm so excited this is definitely number two on my list of favorites so far this year and it's nice to actually have more than one book on that list and thank you so much for hanging out with me I hope you enjoyed this video a big thank you as always to my wonderful patrons over on patreon and especially big thank you to Livia, Lynette Brown and Marie and I will talk to you again soon until then happy reading bye